Good morning, family. As I was snow blowing this morning, the wheel fell off my snow blower. Not one of my better moments. I apologize to God all the way here and ask for forgiveness. We're all human, right? It's just frustrating when wheels fall off the snowblower. They shouldn't really do that, particularly when Home Depot guarantees it and says they put it together and it's going to work. So thank you all. Um, good morning. Can you believe we're actually at the end of 40 days of prayer? It's the completion of this series at Greenwoods. Thank you for staying with us. The sermons have been packed. They've been crammed full of, chock full of information that I think we all needed to hear. We all need to hear. But thank you for bearing through it, grinning and bearing with us. I think it's, it's been wonderful. Um, now, here's what I hope and pray doesn't happen after today going forward, okay? We recycle the sermon and study notes. The helpful inserts that, that we've provided for you. You go home and you say to yourself, great, you know, that was, that was pretty good. I got some helpful nuggets there. Done. What's next? Well, we do have some things coming up, which I'm very excited about, and we're all very excited about, particularly for Easter and, and beyond. But please don't put this prayer stuff away. I want us to continue to learn together and grow together in our communication and connection with God daily. I hope we continue to do that. So don't close the book on daily talking with our Father in heaven. Let's continue to devote daily time in his word, daily time connecting with our maker, with our creator. Let's build on what we've learned over the last 40 days in our alone time. When we're together in groups and with family and friends, can we do that? This isn't the end. This is the starting point for all of us, I believe. So Rick Warren says that he's got probably another dozen sermons on prayer. There might be a 40 days of prayer part two, which we might do. I hope we do. But we don't have to wait for a campaign. We don't have to wait for a program or when part two comes out. We don't have to wait. We can continue our own prayer journey with our Father in heaven regardless of the campaign or program that Greenwoods does. That's what God wants. It's not about the program. It's about prayer. So let's choose prayer daily. Cultivate our relationship with Him daily. I need to do this too. Let's just do it. And let's check in with each other, okay? Ask each other, how's your daily prayer time going? And be honest with your answer. You know, I'm really having a difficult time choosing time every day. I need help with this. Well, Trip, I, I hear you. Do, you. do you want to pray together regularly? Because I need help too. Sure. How about Wednesday mornings? We'll pray together before the day starts. Let's just take 15 minutes and start the day together in prayer. That's wonderful. Do that. That's awesome. We can do that for each other, and we so need it in our daily time. So let's do it together. Keep the momentum going. Now, if we're honest... It's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to keep the momentum going. It's hard to choose prayer when particularly we feel like God isn't answering our prayers. We've learned that throughout Scripture, God promises to answer our prayers. He does. In fact, one of the shortest examples of that is right at the top of our sermon notes. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call to me and I, what does it say, might answer you? No, that's not what it says. Call to me and I will answer you. This is a great verse to memorize. Very simple. Not might, not maybe, not when I feel like it. No, call to me and I will answer you. That's a promise from God. God answers every single prayer. Now, we've learned that he may not answer them the way we like, but that's an answer too, right? No is an answer. Wait is an answer. Not yet is an answer. Grow is an answer. In a little while is an answer. In my way, in my time, according to my plan, those are all answers. And you know, there are many examples in the Bible where God says no to really great women and men of faith. They prayed beautiful, extraordinary prayers. Abraham, 
God says no. Moses, no. Daniel, no. King David, no. Job, Jonah, Elijah, no. Peter, Paul, John. God said no to them. Jesus Christ, no. That's right. Even God's Son heard no. So my encouragement to you, if you feel like God is answering no to you, He's not answering your prayers, you're in great company. Jesus is right there with you saying, I know. Tell me about it. But He still loves you. I still love you. Don't shut us out. Please. I keep going back to the parent-child relationship because it directly relates to our relationship with our heavenly parent, with our Father in heaven, right? Parents say no to their children all the time, right? How often? How many no's for every yes? You know, I would argue the more you love your child, the more no's they're going to hear, right? So that's a foundational truth of our relationship with God. He loves us so much, we're going to hear a lot of no's in our lifetime. Remember this, the first bullet point on your sermon notes. When God says no, it means He loves me. When God says no, it means He loves me. We have to remember that. We have to cultivate that in our hearts. Now that can be confusing, right? Because we're going to get a lot of no's from God in our lives. That can be frustrating if God is truly loving, if God has the power to control everything. Why is my request denied? Why do some people get miracles and others don't? When we pray for people who are sick, why do some of them get well and some don't? Friends, I've prayed for healing for a lot of people who got well. I've prayed for healing for a lot of people who didn't get well. That's confusing. That's frustrating. So why do some people get relief from their pain while others don't? Why do some couples pray for a child? And hallelujah, they get that child while others, just as sincere, claiming the promises of God, don't get that child they pray for. Why? Their hearts are broken. Their faith shattered. So we're asking today, why does sometimes God say yes and sometimes say no? Well, as we ask this question, we have to remember this truth. When God says no, it means He loves me. That's where we need to start. And sometimes we need each other. We need others to remind us of this truth, right? I've said this before, but one of my favorite preaching professors at seminary was Haddon Robinson. And he told all of us in all of his classes, sometimes our faith can shatter. Sometimes we can get hurt, so hurt, that doubt creeps in. And it's in those times that we need others to believe for us. That's okay. That's why we need to be sharing life together, family. We're going to go through some horrible, terrible things. Some of us are here going through something horrible right now. And we need you to believe for us. We need you. We need to pray for one another. We need you to pray for us. Some of us are desperate and we're questioning everything. I've been there. And we need you to take our reins for just a little while. Because the pain is so overwhelming. It's too much to even think about praying or calling to God for help. We need you to pray and believe for us. We need each other. Do you see how much we need each other? So let's break this down. A couple of weeks ago, we had the Super Bowl, right? All over America, most of the world even, people were praying for their team. Some were praying for the Patriots. Some of them were praying for the, for the Eagles. God loves them too, right? No, they actually played a great game. The point is, if God was going to answer our Super Bowl prayers, only 50% would get a yes, right? Some of us would get a no. Two teams can't win one game. Many are guaranteed a no. It's like, I'm praying for my candidate. You're praying for your candidate. 
Clearly, obviously, there's a lot of good, fervent, good people praying for opposing things to God, right? One of us is going to be disappointed. Or think about it like this. There are some prayers that we pray, and if God answered them, he would actually have to take away our free will and our free choice for other people. Do you ever think about that? Friends, our free will, our choice to choose God is a sacred thing, and God would never, ever take that away from us. It's foundational to who we are as human beings. It's a sacred thing. God will never force us to believe Him. Free will is foundational to why He created us in the first place. What if somebody came up to you and said, you know, I'm praying that God forces you to marry me. Well, you're not going to get that prayer. I'm sorry. That will never, ever happen. God's going to say no to that, and that's an answer. God will never usurp, violate, or take away free will. Never. Hallelujah. God will never force someone to stay in love with you. Some of us have prayed that prayer, right? God, please don't take my spouse away. But he or she left. Or you had to leave. Why? Because God doesn't force us to do anything. He never will. We're going to make bad choices all our lives. So will everyone else, right? Others will hurt us. We're going to hurt others. God, I want you to change that person's mind and make them do this. No. God says, I would never do that with you. Why would I do that to someone else? So maybe we're hearing no from God because we're not praying the right prayers, right? Maybe we're getting a no from God because it's time. This is a hard one. This is a really hard one. It's time for one of us to go home. Our real home. With God, with Jesus, the Holy Spirit. You know, we aren't meant to live on this planet forever. We're, we're meant to live forever. I want to live forever. But just not here, right? Not on this planet. Because there's sorrow, there's suffering, there's sadness, sickness, racism, injustice, and abuse, harassment, war, all other horrible things. I want to live forever, but not here. I want to live in a place where there's no sorrow. There's no suffering, no sadness or sickness, no abuse, injustice, no fighting, no tears. Maybe we're getting a no because it's someone's time to go home. We may not understand. It tears us apart. It hurts it breaks our hearts. It angers us. But God has said this person has struggled enough here. This person is ready. I know you want me to keep him or her with you, but I can't. He or she needs to be with me. It's time for him or her to come home. Now, this is important. Side note, as much as we long for eternity in heaven, God has us here on earth for a reason, right? We are part of his plans here. We leave it up to God to determine our timing here, okay? For some mysterious reason, fulfilling his plans for us here prepares us to live with him there in heaven. So even though he'll call our loved ones to him in heaven, away from us, he still has us here for an extremely vital reason according to his plan, okay? So when God says no, that can be a great test of our faith. Probably the biggest test of our faith, right? Prayers that are not answered the way we want will absolutely test our faith. It's tested mine. God says, remember, I love you. So as I say no to you, are you going to continue to trust me, my child? or not. So today I want to do two things. First, I want to give us just a few possible reasons why God says no to us. Now, there are probably thousands and thousands of reasons why God would say no. We're just going to look at three, okay? And then we'll look at some explanations. I want us to explore some reasons that God might be saying no to us. What do we do when God says no to us? But before we move on, 
Would you look at the caution at the top of your sermon notes? This is important. We read, use these, these reasons we're about to explore together, right? Use these to comfort yourself. But never, never use them with someone in pain. Because we don't know why God has said no to him or her. It's very important, okay? Sometimes, and this is important, we need to believe or have faith for someone else in silence. That's hard to do. You can still be a powerful, loving presence in silence. Sometimes it hurts so much that those of us going through difficult situations need to feel and just be in that pain. And there have been times I've been shattered and I just wanted someone there with me, not trying to fix it, not trying to make sense of it, but to just be with me in the pain. Silently, hand on my shoulder, empathy in silence, friends, is healing, powerful. When I took pastoral counseling, my professor told all of us, 50% of any good counseling, pastoral, secular, clinical, therapeutic, anything, is silent empathy. 50% is silence. And it's true. So can we remember this? Let's embrace this with each other. So we're going to look at just three reasons why God says no. But we could be going through a disappointment, a no from God that's not on this list. Another reason to embrace the silence with each other, right? Never presume to know why any of us is going through something. Only God knows why. You know, explanations never really comfort, right? The truth is, if we somehow knew the reason why we were going through something painful, it wouldn't make it any less painful, would it? We often think we, if we understand why something happens, it will somehow make it easier. Well, it doesn't. But it's okay to ask why. Jesus asked why on the cross. My God, my God, why? But even He got to know in that moment. What are you going to do when you don't get the answer you're waiting for? What am I going to do? Some things we won't know until we get to heaven. And even then, it's a maybe, right? So never presume to know why God does something unless He tells you directly, okay? Prime example of this is the story of Job. If you open your Bible right to the middle, chances are it might open to the story of Job or Isaiah. Job was the wealthiest man in the world, the Bill Gates and Warren Buffett of his day, okay? In a single day, he went from hero to zero, literally zero. He lost everything. In a single day, he went from having beautiful children, a large family, who were killed by raiding terrorists. He had a huge family. They were all killed in one day. All of his crops burned. His cattle, sheep, goats, gone. He lost all of his wealth in one day. And as if it could get any worse, he got a terrible, incurable, painful disease that same day. His health gone all in one day. Joe goes out and sits down on the ground in an ash heap just to mourn and grieve in his despair, in that pain. Now, Job had three friends, and those three friends went to him. And at first, they did the right thing. His three friends just came and they just sat down with Job and they just sat there in silent empathy with him in his pain for seven days. That's what a friend does. That's what we need to be doing with each other. When one of us is grieving, we should show up in love and show up in silence. The deeper the pain, the fewer the words. People have told me, Pastor, I don't know what to say to that person who had that tragedy. My answer, good. Go. Don't say a word. Don't say anything. Be a loving presence in that person's life. Be a minister of presence. So for seven days, Job's friends sat there. That's what we need, right? They sat with him on the ground, around him, without saying a word for seven days in the pain with him. The truth is they didn't get into any trouble, 
until they open their mouths. And for the rest of the book of Job, they do a big no-no. They try to explain the unexplainable to Job. This leads to all kinds of trouble, all kinds of pain. Job, you're suffering because of this, or maybe it's because of that. They think they're helping Job by offering explanations. They're not. They're making matters worse. We can hurt each other with our words, right? The point is, they get it all wrong. They don't know why this is happening to Job. And at the end of the book, God actually speaks to Job's friends, and he chastises them for trying to explain the unexplainable instead of just leaving it as a mystery. Here's what God says to Job's three friends. Job chapter 42, verse 7. I'm angry with you, for you have not been right in what you said about me. Wow. My servant Job is the only one who spoke the truth and got it right. Wow. That's comforting. That's encouraging. Because all throughout Job, he's pretty much complaining and saying, God, I don't like this. And God's saying he got it right. It's okay to do that. God, this is terrible. I hate what's going on. I haven't done anything wrong here. God says, you're right, Job. It's okay to complain when you're in the pain. That's okay. You're right, my child. What's not okay is trying to come up with an unfounded, unwarranted, unasked for explanation. We're always on thin ice when we try to explain something when God hasn't. It's dangerous. Remember when Katrina hit New Orleans? People called New Orleans Sin City. And some people, pastors included, said Katrina is the judgment of God on Sin City. That's lousy and hurtful reasoning. I'm sorry. It just is. It's illogical even, because evidently, God did a lousy job judging that city. He actually missed the most sinful part. The most sinful part of New Orleans is Bourbon Street, the red light district, the drug zone, the sex zone, and that is the highest part of the city. And it was untouched. So if that's your reasoning, why did God miss? Everyone else got hurt, right? We're always on thin ice when we try to explain something when God hasn't offered an explanation. It's dangerous and it's hurtful. If God truly judges America, he has every right to. He hasn't yet. But if he does, you know, I don't think he's going to start with unbelievers. I think he's going to start with his church. Why do I think this? Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. The time of judgment will begin first with God's own people, the family of God. Wow. If God decides to judge America, or any other nation for that matter, he's going to start with his family. He'll start with his own family. So what we're seeing out there around us, it's not the judgment of God because the Bible says if it was, he'd start with us. He'd start with his churches. So now we understand these warnings, right? Here are just three of many reasons why God might say no. The first reason, number one, God says no because he has a bigger perspective. God can see what we cannot see. God sees the whole entire picture. We have a limited perspective. God has this amazing ability to see how something we chose in the past directly affects the present with consequences reaching into the future. That's a big perspective. He can see the implications of every single one of our decisions. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. He, God, knows about everyone everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our loving God. Nothing can be hidden from Him. God sees it all. We don't see it all, even when we try to. I can't see it all. Why don't we see? Because our problem with our limited perspective, we can't see unintended consequences 
of the things we're asking for in our prayers. God can see how the dominoes fall in the past, now, into the future. God can see that every prayer that he answers yes starts a chain reaction through time. He knows and sees how that answer we're asking for is going to influence the family around us, our friends, our children, our grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren. He can see multi-generational implications. We can't. So sometimes God says no because he sees something we don't see and can't see. If you could see your life the way God sees it, would your prayers be different? You bet they would. If you could see your life the way God does, would it solve many of our problems? Absolutely. We would never have expected that trouble in our lives, right? Oh, I didn't see that coming because you see it coming. We would never have any unexpected difficulty because we could prepare for it in advance, right? We would never ask for the wrong thing because, oh, I see God, I shouldn't ask for that because, look, it'll create this in my life if I do that. Back to the parent-child relationship. Do we give our children everything they ask for? No, absolutely not, right? Why? Because we love them. Because we, their parents, can see things they can't see as they're asking for everything. God loves you too much to give you everything you ask for. He can see what we can't see. Each prayer has a consequence. Do you believe that? We can't see the implications, the consequences, the ripple effects. Only God can see ahead. Sometimes God says no to our prayers in order to protect us from something we cannot see, in order to guard us, to protect us. Listen to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8. God guards the course of the just. He protects the way of his faithful ones. That's comforting. Yes? Guards and protects. Now, what do they mean? Doesn't mean God takes us all out of the trouble, right? Doesn't mean he'll take us out of the frying pan, right? He'll protect us and guard us, but sometimes he's going to keep us in that frying pan. Why? I think it's the best view to witness his wonder and work. Remember Daniel? Daniel, at one point, was doing the wrong thing. And because of that, the king was going to throw him in the frying pan, right? The lion's den. Daniel prayed, God, keep me, please, out of that lion's den. What did God say? <laughs> no, you're going in, man. Get ready. But Daniel got to see firsthand God shut the mouths of those lions coming at him. He had the best view of God's wonder and working, right? Bigger story. Better results. Personal miracle. Remember the story of the three Hebrew men who defied the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They wouldn't obey the king. What did the king say? We're going to throw you in the giant fire pit, that fiery furnace. And they prayed, Lord, keep us out of that fiery furnace, please. God said, no, you're going in. Get ready. He let them go into that fiery furnace, into the frying pan. But the amazing thing, God was there with him. The guards saw a fourth person in that fire. He walked through the fire with them, and when they came out on the other side, their chains and ropes were burned off. They were free. Bigger story. Better results. Personal miracle. Sometimes we pray, God, don't let me go through this fire. And God says, my child, you're going to go through it. You need to. But when you come out on the other side, you're going to be free. I promise. Free from that habit. Free from that person. Free from that fear. Free from that guilt. Free from that shame. The things you think have been binding you, they're going to be burned off. You aren't going to be free unless you go through that fire. But you know what? I'm going to walk through with you every step of the way. Bigger story. Better results. 
personal miracle. Sometimes God says no in order to set us free. Number two, the second reason, God says no because he has a better plan, right? Sometimes God says, I intend to answer your prayer, just not the way you want it answered. I'm going to say yes, but it's not going to be the yes you expect. It may not even be the yes you think you want, but I have a far better plan for you. In his infinite wisdom, God has a better plan. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9, God says, This plan of mine is not what you would work out. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. For my ways are higher than your ways. God says, my ways are higher. My ways are better. You know, I've got a much better plan for you than the one you're praying for, the one you think you need. And notice ways is plural. God never has just one way of doing something. Unlike us, God's options are infinite and unlimited. He never answers in just one way. Do you believe that? You see, the problem is when we pray, we're not, we not only tell God what we want, we tell Him how we want it. God, I need you to get me out of debt. I've prayed this prayer, friends. God, I need to get out of debt. Lord, if, if I won the lottery, man, that would, that would really just solve a lot of problems for me. And you know what? I guarantee you, God is not going to answer that prayer the way I want Him to. I guarantee it. Why? Because winning the lottery, that's not going to help me grow. God isn't interested in easy answers. He wants to use the best way, which is His way. The best way, His way, will keep us growing and maturing, right? God is far more interested in our character than our comfort. We've learned this before. He, he wants to answer and help us get out of debt, but He also wants us to learn why we got into debt in the first place, right? And how to grow into staying out of debt. That's not the easiest way, but that's His way, the best way, the way that grows our faith, right? Now, sometimes His way, the best way, the way in which He'll grow us, requires a not yet answer, a delay. Sometimes He needs to tell us, not yet. Did you know that in the Bible, many of the greatest people of faith didn't get the answer that they prayed for and were promised until after they left this world? Now, this blows the whole health and wealth and prosperity gospel out of the water. It's a shame, but some people, pastors even, they tell us, they teach us, well, you know, you're not supposed to get, you're not getting what you're asking for because your faith isn't strong enough. Friends, that's not biblical, it's hurtful. I'm going to say it, it's heretical. All the more reason we need each other, right? We need to be sharing life together. Hey, you know, I heard this from this person, and is this biblical? Well, I don't know. Let's pray and explore this together. Let's go to the pastor or go to the elders and let's ask them. Please come to me. Email me. Email the elders if you have questions or concerns or you've heard something that is unsettling. Please. And we'll explore and pray with you, okay? We may not have the answers, but that doesn't mean we can't explore them together, right? We need each other. Ask us. So lots of great people in the Bible didn't get what they asked for. Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Elijah, the heroes of our faith, right? Listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. These, the heroes that we just mentioned, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Elijah, and so on, were commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Wow. Why? God had planned something better. God had planned something better. Listen to this fact. We need to remind ourselves, God has all of eternity to fulfill His promises. Some scholars have counted over 7,000 promises in the Bible. That's a lot of promises, right? But we have to remember that God is not limited by our 80 or 90 or 97 years on this earth. God has all of eternity to fill His promises. 
some of the promises that God has given to us are going to be fulfilled when we get to heaven in eternity. Now, if we're honest with ourselves and, and God, when we look back, aren't we actually going to be thankful for some of the things that God said no to that we asked for? I am. There's some things that I've asked God for and begged Him for that, you know what, years later, I look back, man, that would have caused a lot of damage and havoc in my life if He answered that prayer. Did you know that when Rick Warren was a sophomore in high school, his heart's desire, his plan for his future, his prayer was to become a politician. He received an appointment to the United States Senate to work as a Senate's aide. He had it all worked out, and he prayed that prayer. He was going to move to D.C., start his career in public service in government. And he says that he prayed, God, I want to be involved in government. Use me in our government. God said no. And that summer, he got a job as a lifeguard at a Christian camp. His life was revolutionized. And by the end of the summer, God told Pastor Rick, I have a better plan for you, Rick. Will you trust me? Now he's preaching and sharing God's word to tens of thousands of people in person in his church, 30,000 every Sunday morning. His daily devotional reaches tens of millions of people across the world. Better plan. Better future. God always has a bigger perspective and God always has a better plan. Number three, the third reason. God says no because He has a greater purpose. God always acts out of His nature, His goodness and love for you. He has a greater purpose. God will never let our prayers, God will never let our prayers interfere with His purpose for us. Did you get that? God has a purpose for your life, my life, our lives. He's never made anything without purpose. God will not even let you interfere with His purpose for you. Listen to Psalm 57, verse 2. I cry out to God Most High who fulfills His purpose for me. You see, God doesn't have to explain why to us, right? He doesn't have to tell us why He does what He does. He doesn't owe any of us an explanation. He's God. There are things we couldn't even begin to understand, even if he wanted to explain it to us. There are things we couldn't even begin to wrap our minds around. But he does say, I have a purpose for your life. And nothing, no one, not even you, can get in the way of my purpose for you. Even when we mess up, we will. I will. Even when we make bad decisions, and we will. Even when we hurt others, and we will. God says, my child, even I can use that. I can even use your mistakes. I can even use other people's mistakes. I can fit it all into my purpose for you. That's comforting news, isn't it? In everything God does, in everything He allows in our lives, even the bad stuff, He allows it for a purpose. And that purpose, His purpose, is good, including the problems and the unanswered prayers, right? Right? Look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18. These present troubles, the ones we're going through right now, are quite small compared to eternity, right? They won't last very long. Yet they will produce in us an immeasurably great glory. That's our reward in heaven, friends. That will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen. For the troubles we will see will soon be over. But the joys to come will last forever. Friends, the truth is, if we want more happiness in our lives, we must learn three facts of life. You don't have to write these down. They're in your notes. First, there are some things in life that we're just not going to understand until we get to heaven. The Bible says there are secret things that God doesn't reveal. We couldn't even begin to understand them. So what do we do? Rather than trying to seek those answers, we need to seek God. We need to seek His presence, draw near to Him daily and devotedly. Second truth, there are some things that are going to happen in our life 
that aren't going to change. Some problems are never going to change until we get to heaven. We're in a broken world. <clears throat> and there are some problems, no matter how much we pray, God says, I'm not taking it away. You're in a broken world, my child, and I just want you to learn to manage it. I'll help you if you seek me, but I want you to learn to trust me. That's important in your preparation to be with me in eternity. The last truth, sometimes we need to suffer for the benefit of each other, of other people. We've talked about this before. It's called redemptive suffering. Sometimes we go through painful things so that God can use us to minister that pain to others as they're going through it. God says, I'm going to take your pain in order to bless other people. Trust me, I'm with you in the pain, but I'm preparing you to help so many who need my help. I can't count how many people I've shared my struggle with depression and anxiety. In tears, they've thanked me. When you're depressed, friends, it's a life and death struggle, literally. Depression sucks the hope and joy and belonging out of your life and leaves you empty, isolated, and desperate. That's terrifying. It's a horrifying place to be. And I've been there. And when you are there to have someone look it in your eyes, sit down next to you and gently say, I know what you're going through. Yes, the circumstances between us are different, but I've been where you are. I know what it feels like. I want to be with you in that pain. I don't know what to say. I don't know if I have any answers. I know what it feels like. You are not alone. I want to be with you. You are not alone. I'll be right here. Friends, to hear that when you've given up, when you've had enough, when you can't take it anymore, to hear someone tell you, I've been there, you're not alone, that's life-saving. Literally, God is in the business of saving lives, and He uses us to do this. What a privilege. What a blessing. Sometimes we go through our painful experiences because He needs to save a life. He's better able to use us in His life-saving plan when He prepares us in the pain. God wants to take the greatest pain in your life and use it to save others. Friends, that's what God did for us. That's what He did for us. Jesus Christ, right? God's own Son in the pain with us. God allowed His own Son to suffer for our salvation to save us. That's redemptive suffering. And when He allows you to suffer for the benefit of helping other people, you are most like Jesus Christ in that moment. It's not easy, but we're going to grow up and become more like Christ when we suffer to use that pain to help others. And that's life-saving. So what do I do when God says no? We're going to go over these very quickly. Three things. When God says no, number one, Trust that God does everything in His goodness and love. God does not do anything unloving. God doesn't do anything evil. Everything God does is always for our own good because He loves us. Psalm 25.10 All the ways of the Lord are loving. There are no unloving ways of God. We have to remember this. God cannot act in any other way other than loving. That's who He is. That's His character. That's His nature. God is love. Romans 8.28 In everything, God works for the good of those who love Him. In everything, God works for the good of those who love Him. We need to remember that. We need to remember that when we hear a no. Satan's going to start shooting darts of doubt at us in those moments, right? God doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. Otherwise, he'd give you everything you want, right? He doesn't love you. Satan's a liar, friends. He's a murderer. He's trying to take your life. Jesus calls him the father of lies. Look at your bullet points on the sermon notes. You don't have to write anything down. When Satan is flinging doubt at us, we need to say this, I may not understand God's answer, but I trust that it's motivated by love. 
I do not have to understand God's answer to my prayer to know and to believe that whatever the answer is, it's always motivated by love. So when God says no, we've got three options. Resist it, resent it, or relax in it. God says no, and we can resist Him and fight Him. I've met a lot of people who've turned away from God when they've gotten a no. They just didn't trust that God had a bigger perspective, a better plan, a greater purpose, and they walked away in rebellion. Or we can resent it and become bitter and miserable, and we doubt God's love. We choose to live in misery and can't accept the fact that God only does what's good in our lives, even when He says no. Or we can relax and do it. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Knowing that God always has our best interest at heart. God, you know, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand. It's hard. It's even painful, God. But I know you are good, you are loving, and you will never stop loving me. And even in this, your love still remains. Number two, the second thing we do when God says no, when in the pain, pray what Jesus prayed facing the cross. Jesus prayed a powerful prayer the night before he went to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane among the olive trees. Did you know that Gethsemane actually means where the olives are pressed? Gethsemane was a garden or orchard of olive trees on the Mount of Olives, and it was Jesus' favorite place to pray. He was pressed like those olives that night, right? He knew that tomorrow there would be suffering, there'd be torture. Tomorrow he's going to be disgraced and spat upon. He's going to be whipped. He's going to be crucified. He knows our pain, my family. Do you believe that? He endured it, everything imaginable. Everything unimaginable. He endured it because He loves us. And the Bible says that in that agony, He went to this garden to pray. And the prayer He prayed is the same prayer we should pray when we're in the pain. Mark 14, 35-36. Going a little farther into that garden, Jesus fell to the ground. Have you ever fallen to the ground in despair before God? Sometimes that's all you can do. Continues, praying that if possible he might not have to suffer what was ahead of him. Did you get that? We too often gloss over this. He's saying, God, my Father, I'm your Son. If you love me, if it's possible, I don't want to die on the cross. If there's any other way for the salvation of the world to happen, I don't want to be tortured and die on a cross. So it's okay for us to say, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this suffering. It's okay to say that. Jesus said it. Jesus prayed, Abba, my Father. Remember Abba? Daddy? That's how Jesus wants us to refer to God. Daddy. Intimacy. And here's Jesus' prayer. He prays three things. All things are possible for you. Please take this cup away from me. Yet, I want your will, not mine, to be done. First thing, we affirm God's power in the pain. Jesus says, God, Father, Daddy, I know you can do everything. I know you can do anything. All things are possible. I know you could take care of this situation without me. I know you could keep me out of this suffering. I know you could take away the pain instantly. Father, you're all powerful. Affirm God's power. Second, ask with passion. Father, please give me what I ask. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. That's okay to pray, friends. It's okay to pray. God, take away this pain. Take away the suffering. Sometimes He will. Sometimes He won't. Thirdly, accept God's plan. That's the hardest step. This is hard. However, God, I want what You want. Thy will be done. That's a hard prayer. That's a hard prayer. No, I don't want to go through this suffering. I don't want to go through this pain. But nevertheless... I want what you want. Thy will be done. I want your plan, your purpose, your perspective, your will, not mine, be done, Father. That's trusting God. So finally, the third thing we do when God says no, expect God to give you His grace to handle the answer He gives you. What is grace? We looked at it last week. Grace is God's power to handle the pain of this world. Grace is God's power to do the right thing despite the pain. The Apostle Paul knew firsthand about God's grace. He received many no's from God. 
Often he referred to his thorn in his flesh, and we don't know what that thorn was. Maybe we can ask him in heaven. But it was a lifelong problem that caused him great pain in his life. He says, God had blessed me so much that he gave me this problem, this thorn in my side that just won't go away to keep me dependent upon him. Paul even says, I prayed many, many times for God to take this thorn away, but God never did. He said no. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Three times I prayed to the Lord about this, asked him to take it away. But his answer was, my grace is all you need, for my power is greatest when you are weak. So, Paul says, I gladly boast about my weakness, my pain, my problems, my difficulties, so that Christ's power can flow through me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So what have we been praying about so far that hasn't happened in our lives? Some of us have been praying, God, I just want somebody to love. I want to be married. And as your pastor who loves you, I desperately want that for you too. Please believe me. But we need to remember this. When something hasn't happened yet, God has a bigger perspective. He may be protecting you from an unforeseen problem, from greater pain. God has a better plan. The story has not yet ended, though, okay? Some of you went through a divorce. That's the end of a chapter. The chapter has ended, but the story continues, yes? God is not finished with you. That's not the end of your story. God has a greater purpose, and right now He's working on us and in us, and He will give us the grace and the power to handle everything we go through. He will never put more on us than He puts in us in order to bear it. So look at the last verse in your sermon notes, Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know You, Lord, will trust You. You do not abandon anyone who comes to You. God answers our prayers. God doesn't abandon anyone who comes to Him. Would you pray with me? If you don't trust God when He says no, I think it means that we don't really know Him. Those who know the Lord trust Him and they know He's good. They know He's loving. If you don't trust Him, it means you need to know Him a little bit more. We can get to know Him starting today. Why don't we take that first step to know God, really know Him? Just wherever you are sitting, just say this, Dear God, I want to get to know you. Just say that in your heart. Dear God, I want to get to know you. I want to open my life to you. I want to learn to love you and trust you, and I want to feel your love for me. I want to be close to you. And God, I want your plan for my life, not mine. Mine isn't really working out that well. I want your purpose for my life, not mine. God, I want your power in my life because I don't have any power. God, I want your pardon for all the things I've done wrong. I need your peace. I need your presence. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus. Thank you that he suffered in order to save me and others. And God, if you want to use the pain in my life to help others, please do so. I want to be more like you, Jesus. So today, as much as I know how, I ask you to fill me with your life. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your spirit. Start me on the journey of trusting you more every day. And finally, help me to tell other people about your story for my life. When people see me, I don't want them to see the pain. I want them to see you. Help me, Father. Help us all. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless all of you.